Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture 14 and in this segment we're going to take a look at the polar cell and how exactly that forms in the atmosphere. So with that we'll go ahead and dive right into it but just to quickly refresh your memory this is what we left off with in the previous segment where we took a look at the Hadley circulation or the Hadley cell. In this segment we're going to focus on the polar circulation or the polar cell and this mechanism behind this is pretty similar although it operates a little bit differently. So in the Hadley circulation, we saw that we had strong heating at the equator, which led to rising motions. And in the for the derivation of the polar cell, you know, rising motion then led to the circulation pattern. And in the case of this polar cell, we also have slightly stronger heating as that than we do at the polar regions, but it's not really enough to result in uh, the explosive updrafts that you can see near the equator. So you do get rising motions here, but the mechanism is a little bit, and the process is a little bit different. So here we have, uh, so we have relatively strong heating occurring at around a latitude of 60 degrees north and relatively weak, but comparatively speaking, these two processes are both pretty weak. It's just that uh, the heating is much weaker at the North Pole than it is at 60 degrees north. So you do have relatively warm air uh, being imparted or being witnessed throughout the course of the troposphere than the than what you would have here in the polar at the right at the north pole which would be 90 degrees north and if we want to understand what that actually means for the atmosphere we have to remember the hypsometric equation so at the latitude of 60 degrees north we have more heating taking place throughout the course of the troposphere than we do at 90 degrees north. So on the right hand side of the screen, this is 90 degrees north, which is right at the North Pole, and this is 60 degrees north, which is uh, not quite at the North Pole, and that's the area that's getting the stronger heating. And if this area is getting the stronger heating by the hypsometric equation, that means the spacing between the isobars must be increasing. And if we increase the spacing between the isobars, let's say we hold the 700 millibar isobar fixed, if we increase the spacing and keep this 700 millibar isobar at the same height, that means this 900 millibar surface must get closer to the ground and this 500 millibar surface must get uh, higher up in the atmosphere. So this heating in the uh, middle to lower troposphere is bringing lower pressures down to the surface compared to at the North Pole. So we have relatively low pressure at the surface at 60 degrees north and relatively high pressure right at the North Pole. And one thing that we've witnessed is if you've got low pressure occurring at the surface, then you're going to have convergent flow towards the center of that lower pressure. And if you've got higher pressure at the surface, then you're going to have flow that's diverging away from that. So you're going to get a flow pattern that looks like this. Convergence at the low, rising motion, and then divergence aloft. And then at the high, the center of the high, you'll have diverging motion, sinking motion, and then convergence aloft. Again, near the tropopause level. And this circulation does, in fact, form what's referred to as the polar cell. So typically we get, uh, so if, again, if left to its own devices, if this was the only process taking place in the atmosphere, we would have lots of high pressure around 30 degrees north and lots of low pressure around 60 degrees north. Of course, that's not what we see in the atmosphere, at least not all the time. There are, sometimes that pattern does look like it's there and sometimes it appears to be deviating from that large scale pattern. But this is just sort of an illustration of what would happen if this global scale pattern were left undisturbed, if it were allowed to just do its thing without uh, any other uh, mechanisms disturbing it. And what happens here in the middle latitudes, that's where Rossby waves enter the story. So again, this stems back to what I said at the very beginning of the lecture. Here we've got uh, nature trying to cool this air down at the equator and also at the same time it's trying to bring this warmer air north it's trying to bring the warmer air towards the polar regions where there's colder air and at the same time it's also trying to bring the colder air to the warmer air to try and again resolve that imbalance because nature doesn't like that temperature imbalance it's going to try to bring the warmer air to the colder air and vice versa and the main process behind that transport of warmer air and colder air it turns out that in the 0 to 30 degrees north right in the tropics that air is pretty much warm and has a pretty uniform temperature so it's just really warm here slightly warmer at the equator because of more of the radiation but it turns out this region is just really warm and then the role of Rossby waves which is all the cyclones and the uh, the mid-latitude systems that we know and love it tries to bring that warmer air northward and it also tries to bring the colder air southward and this will make a lot more sense illustratively when we take a look at the structure of uh, cyclones, when we look at the Norwegian cyclone model. But for now, just keep in mind that 
uh, Rossby waves, which is related to surface cyclones, you have all these disturbances that are going through the mid-latitudes, and those disturbances are trying to bring the warmer air northward and the colder air southward. And then similar idea with the polar cell, it's trying to bring the colder air from the uh, North Pole down towards the equator so that it can try to resolve that imbalance. And of course, this imbalance is never going to be resolved because you're always going to have a difference in heating occurring at some place in the atmosphere. So this is just uh, Mother Nature trying to resolve something that actually can't be resolved. It's just an endless cycle of stubborn mechanisms to try and resolve something that's actually never going to resolve itself in the end unless the sun burns itself out. Then it will finally be resolved because Earth will just be cold because there's no uh, radiation at all to heat up the surface, but that's several billion years in the future and not something we have to worry about in our lifetimes. So uh, it will resolve itself at some point. It just, you won't be around to see the end result, which would be a good thing because I wouldn't want to be on the earth when it loses the sun. But that's just uh, an overview of the circulation. So again, Hadley cell usually occurs between zero degrees north and 30 degrees north, polar cell between about 60 degrees north and 90 degrees north, and Rossby waves, which is primarily, which are primar the primary mechanism for bringing the warmer air northward and the colder air uh, equatorward. I should say poleward and equatorward because uh, you also have to think about the southern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere goes through a similar pattern, except here would be, in the southern hemisphere would be zero degrees north to 30 degrees south would be the Hadley circulation, and then 60 degrees south to 90 degrees south would be the polar circulation. But that's going to do it for the first look at the global circulation pattern. And in the next segment, we are going to discuss how this actually leads to the formation of the jet streams in the atmosphere. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.